everybody, I'm Paul, I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is March 6th, 2017. I have a sponsor who very much knows he's my sponsor. Um, I have the privilege and honor of sponsoring other men and women in this program. Some are on here tonight and I have a home group. It's the Miami group. Phil, thank you so much for all the very kind words. I also have a cat that's going to be part of our talk tonight because he doesn't understand the word no, um, which is if you saw me screaming in the screen prior to the meeting, like he just doesn't understand the word no. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I have a home group. It's called the Miami group. We were down in Miami, Florida. When you were, anybody is ever down here, we would love to have you join us. Um, Phil, thank you for that beautiful introduction because I don't know if I agree with everything you just said. Uh, <laughs> some days I think my sponsor is wonderful and some days I, you know, some days I'm not so fond of him, which probably means he's the right sponsor for me. Um, it's, you know, this is, it's weird. I remember when, uh, I remember when I met you and I remember when, when Zoom started because of COVID. I remember when Zoom started because of COVID and I remember um, we, we, uh, we jumped right on and we like, we were booking speakers every night. And, and I, at the point, at that point, it was one of my service positions. And I literally would call my sponsor almost to tears. And I'd be like, look, I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. So I was like, this is a lot of work. And uh, he very quickly pointed out to me that if I wanted to stay sober, that, that I would go to any links. And that's what I agreed to when I got sober. So um, it's, man, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. There's a lot of people in this meeting, which is, it's, amazing but shocking we started we resumed i think it was like maybe well we never we stopped for like maybe eight months um we stopped for about eight or nine months during the COVID, and then we resumed back to in-person hybrid meetings which we still have um but it's it's beautiful to see this many people still still doing this and uh i think that uh i think COVID changed the face of alcoholics anonymous forever and i don't necessarily think that's a bad thing or a good thing as as i was taught by my sponsor i have no opinion um, there's some people on here tonight, including Steven, who I, I know have some sobriety. So it makes a little more nervous because, you know, like when you have people with time, you don't want to you don't want to get on here and speak poorly. That never <laughs> that never fares well. So anything I say, let me be really clear. Anything I express tonight um, is probably more an opinion. It's, it's me parroting what I've heard from other speakers and what I've experienced so far in my program. I, uh, <clears throat> I am very grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous today. I cannot say that was necessarily the case when I, when I initially came in. I, uh, I'm currently doing a step series. Um, I just finished a step series and I started another step series down here. And, uh, and I was sharing on, on step two, which if anybody is, you know, like I'm sure everybody knows this, it's not an easy step in a step series. It's hard to share for an hour on step two. But um, one of the things I love about this program is that it pushes me to continually have to expand it's after expand. I love this cat like seriously this cat's probably the best gift I ever got in sobriety it pushes me it pushes me to expand um my growth in this program and and that's the reason I'm here when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous at the age of 46 um I was a guy who did not want to be an Alcoholics Anonymous I did not think I was an alcoholic I came here primarily because I had uh, gotten myself in a lot of trouble with the court system in Florida um, and, and I have no problem sharing it. It's not that I'm going to fist up in the podium. I actually openly share it. I, uh, I got here because I picked up a cord, um, wrapped it around my ex-husband's neck, tried to strangle him, um, and was hauled off to jail. I'd been on a seven-day bender. Um, I had completely lost my mind. It talks about the insanity in our program. And, uh, and I got taken off, and I was looking at some really serious time. I was looking at 36 years in prison. So I... Uh, I can say through the grace of God <laughs> that I'm sitting here today sharing with you guys, because really I shouldn't be here. If life was fair and the world was worked the way it was supposed to work, you would have a different speaker tonight, or I'd be sharing from a, from probably a state penitentiary right now. But um, you know, what I found is if you're new in this program or you're new in here tonight, or this is like, you know, you're in your first year that uh, at least my experience was that when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, it, it turned out to be very different than what I thought it was. And again, I was a guy who came in who didn't want to, I, I, first off, I didn't think, and I'll share about this later, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I, I, I definitely did not think, I would have told you I was a lot of things, but an alcoholic was not one of them. And, um, and so for a guy like me, I, I feel like I have a lot of love for this program just because I have the ability to sit with you guys tonight. Um, I just celebrated five years of sobriety on, on March 6th. And for me, for a guy like me, that's unheard of. I spent my entire life trying to get sober or trying to figure out what the problem was. And I could not put together what the problem was. 
So uh, <clears throat> I'm not a huge person on war stories, but I'm going to go back and talk a little bit how I got here. I, uh, I, I was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and if you'd heard my share maybe two or three years ago, you would have had a very different share. But I was born and raised in, in a very wonderful, amazing family. Um, my parents absolutely did the best they could with me and my sister. I, uh, I don't think that any more than I think that I'm a gay man. I don't think that the, my, I don't think that's any different than like I was born that way. I was born an alcoholic, but it's interesting because I grew up with a family of alcoholics and I didn't want to be one. I didn't want to be my father. I didn't want to be my grandfather. I saw people that had these traits and these natures um, and these behaviors that I was just appalled by. And I remember being a little kid being like, look, I'm not going to, I remember telling my mom, like, I'm never going to be my dad. Like, I promise you, I love, and this is like an eight or nine years old telling my mom this. I'm like, I love you. I don't ever want, and you know, my dad is a wonderful man. He's an absolutely wonderful man, but he suffered from the same disease I suffered from. And um, when you're a kid and you experience that and you can't understand or you can't place it, I just thought he was a bad person. My father's not a bad person. Um, and I don't think I'm a bad person. I think for most of my, my childhood, um, especially at least, at least from my report card said, I was the guy that I was the guy that always got the report cards, like has great potential, could do wonderful if he would just focus. You know, because I was already restless, irritable, and discontent at an early age. I was the kid that sat in class and looked out the window and daydreamed. I was the kid that got into trouble because I was the class clown. I was the kid that was always causing disturbances because I didn't know how to be peaceful within myself. And it was like that from the time I can remember being young. Um, I remember uh, I remember going through this, this whole process with my sponsor. And, um, and I remember telling him like very early on that, I, that I, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. And, you know, we started going through my fist step and I started looking back at my drinking. And I remembered, it was weird. I think I was in Las Vegas at like two years sober and at a convention that my grand sponsor does. And I remember sitting there and I was inside the room and I'm listening to these speakers and I look at them, I'm like, you know what? I'm, like, I'm not a freaking alcoholic. This is, I don't even know why I'm here. Why am I in Vegas? Like, now mind you, I'm on probation for 15 years. So I shouldn't be in Vegas. I shouldn't even left the state of Florida. God's already doing for me what I can't do for myself, but I'm in this room saying I'm not an alcoholic. And he kindly walks me out the hall and starts like breaking down everything I shared with him and my fist tap. And I was like, you know what? Let me just go back in and sit down and be quiet. And the truth was, is I remember as a kid, um, and I remember sharing this, like it's one of the things you share with me. I remember as a kid, my parents would have these parties and I would see them drinking and the glasses. And then I was like, God, I can't wait till I'm an adult so I can do that. I'm like, that looks like so much fun. And I, uh, and I, was, I was convinced I was going to have that life. I was already convinced at that point I was going to have that life. Um, went to high school. I, like, and I, this is the thing. Unfortunately, I'm an intelligent alcoholic, which I think is probably the worst kind of alcoholic because my intellect is high. I've always done really well. I've always achieved well in everything that I ever tried to put my hands on. But for a guy like me, that's the worst kind of alcoholic because my brain will tell me that I'm okay in this area, this area, this area. This area. You can handle this. You got this. And the truth was I couldn't. So I, I remember my, uh, my junior year in high school, I had enough credits to graduate. I didn't graduate. I went ahead and stayed for my senior year. I had to take one class. I was a teacher's assistant like the other six hours of the day. And I spent most of that year drinking. I was, uh, I was getting ready to, to walk the stage of graduation. <laughs> I'd been day drinking all day with my friends. And then um, we were going on stage and the, the, the vice principal came up and he's like, you can't walk the stage. And I'm like, why? He's like, you're drunk. You know, and, and I... As I look back on that, once I got sober, I could see it. But for some reason in my entire life up until I was 46, things like that didn't register. The disease didn't register that that was a problem, that at the age of 18, I was being told I couldn't graduate or walk the stage from high school because I was already drinking and drunk. And my alcoholic mind working the way it does told me like, you're fine, you have no problem. So I, uh, I, I did graduate, I went to college. Um, I was, I think, three years sober when I was going to go back to, to college again. And I remember pulling my, I went to several colleges throughout my life. And I remember pulling my transcripts and um, I was telling my sponsor, I'm like, I should be good. I should be able to transfer almost all my credits. And I pulled my transcripts from my first college, which was Northwest Missouri State University in Mary Mill, Missouri. And, um, and it, my, it read like this. It literally read like F, F, withdrawal, withdrawal, F, F basic introduction to college passed like I, one day I passed one day but I still couldn't you know the thing was I still couldn't see the alcoholism of that 
I, uh, I remember leaving that school and um, my, I'd moved back in with my mom. I flunked out of my first semester. I moved back in with my mom and uh, worked a summer job. And she said, look, she goes, you have two options. She goes, you can move in with your boyfriend. She goes, or you can go to California and live with your aunt and uncle. And you can go to college out there and they're willing to give you a second shot. And of course, I mean, like I'm a 19 year old man living in, in Kansas City, Missouri. And it's not that I have a problem with the Midwest. I, I'm a gay man. I'm like Los Angeles, here I come. So I jumped on that, that, that opportunity and I went to Los Angeles and um, all I had to do was go to school and make good grades. Like my aunt and uncle paid for everything else. They paid for my, my food, my clothing, my tuition. All I had to do was go to school and make good grades. And I did, I pulled straight A's. But after the first semester, they asked me to leave their house. And, um, you know, and at the time when I look back on it, I was pretty upset. I was like, I'm like, you know, why are you guys asking me to leave? But I was already drinking and partying. I was coming in their house late at night drunk. I was being rude and disrespectful. I was disrupting their house, their home. And still, I don't see a problem. So I left their house I'm like a good alcoholic at the age of 20. I got a job. I'm working in a bar in West Hollywood, California as a bartender and barback. Um, I'm a ripe 20 years of age. And I've picked a profession where I can do what I love to do, which is drink. And I, uh, and I did that. And for the next couple of years, I, uh, I drank excessively. Um, I still went to school and I still made good grades. So again, I didn't see this as a problem. And I, uh, I, you know, it's funny. I was, I was talking about this the other day. I remember, so I was, I was working as a bartender and a bar back at night. And then I was going to school and working a day job. And I was also working a second job. I worked for a car rental company in Burbank. And, um, and I remember, <laughs> I remember like, so I worked for a really nice car rental company in Burbank. Like, and we were by the airport. We had all these executive clients. It wasn't just your typical, like it was thrifty car rental, but it wasn't your typical, like just people coming off the airplane. We had all the entertainment industry because we were right next to Burbank out in LA. And, um, and so part of, part of our salary was that we would get a free car every night to drive. Well, like on my fourth car, I brought back that it either had a door missing off the side of it. And it was literally in the backseat as I drove it back into work the next day or the fourth car that I had wrecked, they were like, you know what, Paul, we're like, we like you as an employee. They're like, but you can't have any more cars. They're like, every time we give you a car, you destroy it. And it was never because I was drinking too much. You know, I mean, it was, but I would have told you something different. I told them, oh, this person hit me or this happened, or, you know, it was always an excuse. And I share all this with you guys, because the truth was, is I still couldn't see the alcoholism. I couldn't see that I was the guy at the age of 24 where um, I'm getting taken to a hospital over in Burbank because my, my blood alcohol level is so high that I literally have alcohol poisoning and I go into seizures on the freeway and they got my friends with me or I probably would have killed multiple people and maybe myself. I'm a guy that was like, oh, you know what? I went out and party too hard. And my sister has to come pick me up and get me out of the hospital. And it's, it's ironic as I look back on it, it's ironic as I look, as I look back at my life and I, I hear me talk about this, that I just could not see that there was a problem, that I suffered from a disease. I, I just was unwilling to, to realize that I had a problem with alcohol. I, I would have said it was anything else. And um, at the age of 25, I, uh, I was working two jobs, going to school, and I worked one of the jobs I worked was at, a, was at a, uh, a bar, and I was a bouncer over in Burbank. It was a country western bar, a gay country western bar. I know the irony of that is hysterical. But, um, like, and uh, this guy came walking down the street, and I looked at my friends, and I was like, I'm going to marry that guy. And they were like, and I'm like, I'm like, that's the man I'm going to marry. And, um, and that idiot waited for me to get off work for 12 hours um, to take me to dinner. We went on one date, and that was it. We were together for the next 21 years. But I share that with you guys because I took that man hostage that night. I didn't enter into a relationship that was, was over the next 20 years that was healthy or strong or great. I took that man hostage. Um, and as I share, hopefully, you know, as we go through this process, you, you're going to hear some of the stuff I did to him. This is the same guy I just told you that I tried to kill. And um, so we, we went on the first date, like, you know, we started dating. It was like, three or four months into dating and he was um he owned a, a large record label in los angeles he owned a very large limousine company um he grew up very affluent and he was but he wanted to do something different he wanted to go into the police academy and become a police officer and i remember discouraging him telling him like listen don't do that i don't want you to get shot i love you the truth was is i still wanted to drink and party the way i wanted to and I didn't want him to become a cop so I wouldn't get trusted. So I literally would not get arrested. And, and so I convinced him of going out of the police academy. Now, I can't say if that's good or bad, but I can tell you looking retrospectively, that's not a very, not a very good person. I literally convinced somebody not to do a career for my own selfish needs. And I still at this point can't see it. 
I, uh, I continued to progressively drink worse. And by the age of 29, I had, um, I had drank to a point where my life had completely fallen apart. Like it had gotten to a place where it was really bad. And I, uh, I had been awake for like five or six days. I, I like to use the expression because I like to respect the rooms of AA. I, I did every pill, powder, potion, and lotion to fix my emotions, as my sponsor would say, to get through my life. And uh, at the age of 29, I'd done a lot of pill powders, potions, and lotions at night. And um, I, uh, I, there was a magazine. This is so stupid. There was a magazine next to my bed. And I remember reading the back of the magazine. And I was like, and in the magazine, in my head, God was telling me to off myself. He was like, you're never going to be anything. He's like, you're a loser. Like, just be done with yourself. I picked up the phone. I called my mom after I'd swallowed, like, I don't know, like 10 bottles of pills, downed it with a bottle of vodka. And I said, I love you. I said, this has nothing to do with you. And I apologize. And I hung up the phone. Now, my mom had put up with my behaviors enough at that point that she knew what was going on. And um, she called my ex-husband. And at that point, my husband and called, you know, he called the paramedics and they got there before he did. And they found me dead in my bed. They had to resuscitate me. Um, and I, you know, I, it's interesting how God works because my mom and sister were just here for my five-year anniversary. And, um, you know, like when I, when I tell that, when I was looking at her and I can do it tonight, straight face, when I was looking at her, when I was talking about the, from the podium, man, I started bawling because like you can't get much more selfish than doing that to your parents. Like there's not much more selfish you can do than to kill yourself or try to kill yourself from a disease and call the one person in the world who's always stuck by you and loved you the most. But I still didn't think it was a problem. I survived that. Uh, I survived that that overdose or death attempt. Um, and two weeks later, I was back in a hospital on an overdose, um, strapped to a bed in ICU. And um, I still, you know, at that point, I knew there was a problem, and I, uh, I I was at least willing to do something about it. I very much did not want to admit I was an alcoholic, so I went to a, I went to a different fellowship <laughs> for a while. And, uh, and thought that was a problem. But the truth was, is that, that I walked in that fellowship, I didn't do a single thing. I mean, I did what I thought I was supposed to do. Like I went to meetings because, you know, meeting makers make it. No, they don't. Meeting makers make meetings. <laughs> Just because you go to a meeting will not keep you sober. Meetings are a part of the process, but they are not what keeps us sober. They are a part of the process. And, uh, and I very, I just did it very shoddy. And over the next five years, um, things progressively got worse. Now, the problem is this, is that because my partner, I had a successful business, because I worked throughout my 20s and 30s, you guys, you heard the, the rough side. The other side, flip side is this. I worked for the CDC for almost eight years, and I worked for LA County Department of Health Services for almost 10. Um, and I had positions where I was able to maintain those jobs and do the things that I did in my work life and be very successful at it. I started and ran the very first mobile HIV testing unit in this country. And I share that with pride because at least I was, at least in my, my sickness, I was doing something to benefit somebody else, but I still couldn't see even in that how sick I was. I went into the music industry um, and I did that for almost 25 years. And by the age of 36, I had an album take off. It was 2004 and um, it did really well. I went on tour with a very famous artist. I acquired six Grammy nominations that year and I was making ridiculous amounts of money and I was touring the world and I had freedom. I had freedom to do whatever I wanted. I could live my life the way I wanted to live it, how I wanted to live it. And, um, and it, for me, that's like, that was death for this alcoholic because you can't give me free reign like that with a disease like this. My disease wins every single time. And, uh, and I progressively just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And, um, I obviously at the age of 36, I was back out running again. I was drinking as much as I possibly could. I was living a, a very debauched life. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody here knows about the entertainment industry, but you, if well, I don't care how great you are, how bad you are, no one sits on top very long and no one sits on top forever. And so it was a very short lived, like when I say short lived, like my four years, five years, nobody, nobody cared who I was anymore. Nobody even wanted to book me mostly because of my behaviors, but mostly because I hadn't put anything out decent, in, you know, in a long time. And people were like, this, you know, I was just like a, a one hit wonder, I guess is a good way of putting it. So I, uh, I, I didn't have to work, you know, our companies were making money. And so I could sit at home and let my disease just work on me. And that's what I did. And I couldn't figure out why my life was getting worse and worse and worse and why I couldn't put things together and why I hated myself so much and, and why everything was so bad and why was my marriage falling? You know, I couldn't figure it out. 
And um, at 40, 45, I had uh, my, my ex-husband and I had moved to Aventura. We'd, uh, we'd lived in Los Angeles for 16 years. We lived in Missouri for three again. And then 2009, we moved down here to Miami. And um, I lived in Aventura and I was laying in my bed. Um, and I, we lived in this, this three bedroom condo. It was on the 30th floor. So we had these incredible views. Um, and I remember looking out and this was after having like a lot of really rough, I'm, I'm generalizing, but a lot of really rough patches. And I'm looking out um, over the sky and I looked at God and I just said, I said, I can't do this. I'm like, I'm exhausted. I'm like, either kill me or help me because I don't, I can't do this anymore. And, uh, and mind you, when I'm saying this, I'm on house arrest because I'd already been on house. I'd already been arrested a month earlier. It was on a lovely Department of Corrections ankle bracelet so that I was monitored and couldn't leave my house. But yet there's still no problem. Um, and I'm laying in that bed and I look out and I say this prayer. And the next day is when my partner and I have this fight and I, and we get into an argument. We'd had several arguments. We were both big guys. I'm not justifying it. We had a lot of physical altercations. Um, and that was my disease. Like I'm not a violent person. I'm not naturally aggressively a violent person, but you take away what I consider being a medicine. And I promise you, you'll see a side of me that's not pretty. And uh, we got into a fight. I picked up the cord off the sink. I wrapped around his neck. I started to close the circle and I saw myself in the mirror and I dropped it and I started to bawl. And uh, I had gone, this is, this is, <laughs> I should laugh, it's funny. I thought he'd originally called the police on me. Like, I was like, all right, this is like, this, this jerk called the police on me. I'm like, now I'm going to prison. And I had gone on Facebook and posted help. He's trying to kill me. And one of my friends who was trying to help me called the police. Well, because I was on house arrest, there's no question of who's going to jail. I was going to jail. And, you know, it's, I, I look back on that ironically now of, of, I remember very specifically saying that prayer and asking God for help. And I remember those eight cops came through my front door with lasers pointed on me and dragged me out of my bed. And I'm thinking, how, oh my God, like I prayed to you, how could you do this to me? Like you took everything. And uh, I didn't know at the time those cops were eight angels. And when I say that now, I mean that truly, they were eight angels that, that took me out of my house, but they held me off to jail. And this time it was serious. Um, I had double charges, one from the month ago, the previous ones, which were attempted murder with my ex-husband. And uh, I was looking at 36 years in prison. And um, I remember laying in that jail cell and very specifically not being able to even say the Lord's Prayer. Like I could not remember our Father who art in heaven. Now, mind you, I was, if you guys heard me, I was raised in Kansas City, Missouri. I was raised Southern Baptist. My ex-husband was Jewish. I tried to convert to Judaism. Um, There's some things that happened. They wouldn't let me do it. So I became what's known as a Messianic Jew. So I, I still practice that to this day. Um, but I was a guy who couldn't remember the Lord's Prayer. That's probably one of the most important prayers I've ever said in my life. And um, something clicked. Something clicked in my head. And at the time, I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I was at a place where I was completely exhausted and couldn't go forward anymore. And uh, I very much... <laughs> I very much remember thinking that my life was over, but it wasn't. It was just the beginning. It was literally just the beginning of this journey. And what happened, and, and if, if you're new in this room, this is what God did for me in that moment. I couldn't see it until years later. I couldn't even see it a year later or two years later. It took me almost three and a half years to my sobriety before I was able to fully understand what God had done for me that night, but God took away everything. He took away my ego, my pomp, my money, my relationship, my possessions, my cats, my cars, anything I ever had any attachment to God separated me from. And he left me in a place for four months where I had to sit and look at my life, how I got in there and where it was headed. And in that moment, now, like when I, when I, when I see it now, I so clearly see that my higher power had answered that prayer and was working in my life. That he put me in a place where, where finally there was something greater than Paul between me and my alcoholism. But in that moment, I absolutely couldn't see it. And so I thought my life was over. And, um, I remember, uh, I remember reading that jail. I remember like going to this, this chapel thing they had, it was non-denominational. And I mean, I was starting about this the day. I can literally remember that room. I could smell it. I can tell you the chairs. I can tell you what everything looked like. And that was the first time, like two weeks into jail where I finally started to like surrender just a little bit. And they had, um, they had some different literature in there, obviously religious literature of different variations, but they also had some information on Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And because I'd been in a previous program, I knew that I had a problem, but I'd still, mind you, still, I'm still not an alcoholic, you guys. Just so we're clear on this, this is how sick I am. I'm literally sitting in jail, looking at 36 years of prison, but I'm still not an alcoholic. So I start to read that literature and I start, it starts, some of it starts to make sense. They didn't have the big book. It was like some pamphlets and I don't remember what it was. I think it was something like, I don't remember what it was. It was a weird book, but I started to comprehend it was something. And so I, uh, I got court ordered to this, this beautiful treatment center in Miami um, after jail, um, it, like bougie massages, great. No, I'm just kidding. It was a department of corrections facility. It was horrible. It was bed bugs. It was like the worst. It was the worst. And thank God they did that because I was still full of ego at this point. Um, and so I got cornered to that treatment center and this guy came in who might be on here tonight or not. He was just at my house maybe an hour ago because he's, he's like my brother now. And he shared this story. And this guy was from Venezuela and he was raised in Miami and we had literally nothing in common, like zero in common. But he raised his hand and he started to share. And as he shared, I heard my story and I was like, holy crap. I was like, that's me. I'm like, how does this guy know my life? How does he know how I feel? And I've always felt about myself and how much I hate myself and, and how I can't get my life together. And, and, and he, he literally told my story. And so I went up to that guy because part of what he said was he does this thing. for anybody that knows Adolfo, he has this really raspy voice and he talks like this. And he's like, I had this key and this is the key to my family's house. He does this whole thing about how he, uh, he has this key to his family's house and how they trust him. And I'm sitting in this treatment center, like wearing jail clothing still, slides. And let me be really clear, you guys. I'm not a jailer. I'm a bougie gay man. I do not like anything that is, is not comfortable and I'm not accustomed to. So I'm not doing the treatment center real well. And I definitely didn't do jail real well. But he's holding this key up and he's like, he's like, I have this key to my house. So I'm like, I'm like sitting there and I'm like, I don't have a key to anything. I'm like, I literally have nothing left. I was like, what do I have to lose? I'll ask this guy to sponsor me. And I walked up to that guy and I asked him to sponsor me. And that's where my journey started to change. That's where I started to see my alcoholism for the first time. He was an amazing first sponsor. He was my, my sponsor for my first um, eight months of sobriety. And God bless this man. He would literally, this is how sick I was. I was, I was there for two months and he would, he would take, now he lived like in another part of Miami and I was up in North Miami. He would take a bicycle and a train to come sponsor me, to come read me the big book. And I'd be like, you know what, bro? I'm like, I'm really tired. Like I worked in the kitchen this morning and then we had group therapy, <laughs> therapy, um, <laughs> like all, I'm like, I can't meet with you. And he would just, I guess at this, because we have the same sponsor now, he would call our sponsor just be like, I hate this guy. And then he was like, oh, you can't stop sponsoring. That's what he would tell him with me. But thank God this man was loving and patient and kind and tolerant with me because I, I was still really sick and I didn't know it. And uh, he took me through the steps and then he pushed me on to, to, to our current sponsor. And the reason he did it was we're not, we're 11 months apart, but we grew really close in that process. And um, we were both still so early in sobriety. I, I think he could see that I needed something more spiritually because I really was sick. And, and there was a, when I say he left my house an hour ago, he's very straight. I don't want to give him a bad name here. He's totally straight, but he's like a brother to me. We are best friends. Like he is the best friend I've looked for my entire life and never had. And uh, so I, uh, I went through the steps with him and I started to kind of have an understanding of Alcoholics Anonymous. I still, I still didn't, I still wasn't convinced I was an alcoholic. Because to me, an alcoholic was, was a guy that was horrible because I couldn't see that I was a horrible person. If you guys heard everything I just transpired, I could never look at the fact that I harmed other people or that I punched my husband numerous times. I couldn't look at the fact that I wrecked cars, destroyed lives, called my mom up at three in the morning and called her the C word multiple times, do the same thing to my sister, cuss my father. I couldn't see the destruction that I was doing around me. I saw in my eyes, because I'm sick and I suffer from a disease that's perception, I saw where I would, don't you know who I am? I'm Paul Rhodes. Don't you, I have six Grammys. I've toured with so-and-so. I, I did this. I, did, I would never look at the fact that I was sick. My disease kept my ego so inflated and so far in the front that I was incapable of seeing how sick I was. Um, and the truth was, is that, that, that I didn't, I don't even know if I wanted to admit that I was an alcoholic, but I, I went through the steps. I, uh, I, I redid the steps a second time with my current sponsor. Actually, I've redone the steps a couple of times with my current sponsor and, and something started to shift. Something started to change. And I remember, like I just said, I was in Vegas at year two. Um, I, I was a guy that, that was looking at a ton of time, um, 
in prison. And I'm a guy who, who I'm a guy where I heard people, I still hear people say, they're like, oh, you got sober because, you know, the, because, because of the consequences, once you get off those, you won't be sober. Look, this is the deal. That was absolutely true in the beginning, but I would have never admitted that. I would have never said, I'm so fearful of going to prison. This is why I'm doing Alcoholics Anonymous. I would have never admitted that I was so fearful of not completing what they asked me to complete that I was willing to do this. But the truth is, is that, that you don't do AA, at least the way I was taught to do AA in my lineage, if you don't want to be sober. I, and I'm not saying this to brag, like in my family, like the way we work, you sponsor everybody. If somebody asks you to say, you say yes, there's no one, no. You go to your home group, you have a home group, you have commitments in your home group. You do an H&I panel every single week. You give back, you help others, you are constantly in service. I don't care what it is, how it is. Like, so I currently sit as our GSR. I'm also the, uh, I'm also the chair of the phone relay line for Intergroup for Miami-Dade. I have like, I have so much service that sometimes I want to cry. But my actions in this program are what keep me sober. Because if I continue to listen to that head, if I continue to listen to that voice of this disease that told me that I'm not good enough, I can't do it, that, that you're not this, that you're not an alcoholic, I promise you guys, you would have a very different speaker tonight. So I'm, I'm the kind of sick alcoholic who doesn't want to admit he's a sick alcoholic. And I went through the book and I read the doctor's opinion with, with Henry again. And, um, and every time I read it and I read that thing, oh my God, was, I've had, I probably sponsored like 300 people. So I've read that, that freaking thing so many times. Sometimes I just, I'm like, let me just recite it for you. It'd be easier. Um, but every time I read it, I see myself now and I hear myself now. And it absolutely blows me away how my entire life, I just denied myself that honest truth that I was an alcoholic. I did not, I couldn't comprehend. So I, uh, if you heard me earlier, I said I worked for the CDC and LA County Department of Services, and I worked in biology and immunology. So a lot of my friends during the 90s were dying from HIV. Um, it hit our community really hard, and I went into that. And then after I left that, I also went into pediatric hematology and oncology for a while. So for two years, I worked in that field. And um, I was a guy who said, look, the kids that die from cancer have a disease. Your alcoholism is something you can control. If you just have enough willpower, if you are just strong enough, you can stop drinking. That's an excuse. Stop using the excuse because I could not perceive alcoholism as a disease. I couldn't see it as something that I suffered from the same way I suffered from diabetes three years ago, or the same way a kid suffers from cancer, or an adult suffers from a disease. I couldn't see it. So I didn't understand that I had a disease the rest of my mind. And that once that disease takes over, that once that that once I put that physical drink into my body, that once that mental obsession occurs, I cannot find relief unless I have another drink or a spiritual solution. And so I sat most of my life very lost and very confused, not understanding, not wanting to understand and denying that I was an alcoholic because I'm, again, and I said this again, I'm very intellectual. So when I read the doctor's opinion and he broke it down, Dr. Selkworth broke it down, I was like, oh, I was like, well, wait a minute. This is starting to make a little more sense now. And so I was able to hear something where I could accept it, where I could finally start to accept it. And, um, you know, I, I think for, for me, at least for this type of, or at least for the alcoholic I am, I, uh, I very much was a kind of guy who, who I could comprehend the big book, but I couldn't always spiritually relate to it. I, uh, when, when Phil met me, I worked for a church in, in Brickell. Um, <laughs> I just left that job two months ago. I worked there for four years. It was the first job I got in sobriety and it was the last job I've had. Um, and, you know, I think, I think sometimes God does for us in this program what we're incapable of doing for ourselves. If you guys heard me share, I was raised Southern Baptist and um, I did not mess with that. And, and please, if you're Southern Baptist, I don't mean this to be offensive. It's not that it's, it's good or bad. It didn't work for me. There were things expressed that I just couldn't relate to. And so I became Jewish. And then there were things that were expressed there that I couldn't relate to. So I became a Messianic Jew. And then I was a guy who worked in a Presbyterian church. If you don't hear what I'm saying, I'm a guy looking for a spiritual solution and had been my entire life. I was just trying to find God. I was trying to find something so I could be peaceful with Paul. But no matter where I looked, I couldn't find it because I couldn't find a God of my understanding. I had a concept and a belief and a system that I thought God was a certain way. And so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous very prejudiced and very full of hate. I remember walking in, now, now when I say hate, like 
it's almost like in our book, it talks about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's how we are. Like we drink and like we're, we're good. And then we drink and we turn into crazy maniacs. I can relate to that. But it was the same thing for my belief in a, in a power greater than myself. I'm a guy who came in who on one side had been raised in a very religious family. I'm an ordained minister. I had a, a great, strong spiritual belief in one area. Yet I was the guy on the other side who was like, I don't even know if God's real. I'm doing this because this is what I was taught, not because what I believe. And slowly through working these steps and slowly through going through this process, I came to a place where I was able to slowly comprehend a power greater than myself and have a God of my understanding. Because the God I pray to today is not the same God I prayed to when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. The God that I go to when I feel like my life is falling apart today is not the same God I went to when I first came in. I, uh, at first off, let me apologize, you guys. I don't... I. It, I come from a, a, a lineage where if you're not in a certain, even on Zoom, if you're not in a certain tie, your your butt's in trouble. But I uh, I had a double hernia operation two weeks ago. Um, I'm still recuperating. I had some physical side effects today for the first time because I'm a good alcoholic and I don't listen to my doctor. They told me to rest and take it easy. They told me not to do certain things. I went on a 10 mile bike ride yesterday, a 10 mile bike ride today. I went back to the gym yesterday, started lifting weights, and now I'm suffering the consequences of my own actions. So I do apologize for how I look because I don't normally dress like this. But um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm a guy who is very stubborn, who doesn't want to believe in God, who doesn't want to believe that power. I believe when, when I tell you guys that there's a God of my understanding today, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't call my sponsor when my life falls apart anymore. I don't need to because he did what he was supposed to do. He connected me to a power greater than myself. He transmitted the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. That doesn't mean I don't have moments. But those moments look like doing steps six and seven. It means, it means slowing down, admitting my shortcomings, praying and meditating so that I can hear that connection. Because I suffer from a disease that sits in my mind. And the only thing that will fix it is a spiritual solution. So if you're like me, which if you're in this room, you are. Whether you, whether you think you are or not, you're an alcoholic. If you're like me, the only thing that, that ever puts that at ease is a connection to something greater than myself. And it took me a long time to grasp that. It took me a long time to understand that. And uh, I did not walk into Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous thinking God was great. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and for a long time, my home group was my higher power. For a long time, my sponsor was my higher power. For a long time, there were a lot of things my higher power. But do not be confused by this. And I don't say this to scare anybody off. This program is based in a, is based in a spiritual solution. I don't get to define for you what that spiritual solution is, but it's based in a spiritual solution. And I truly believe in my heart, if you don't find that spiritual solution, you will not find freedom from this disease. Because I was incapable. I'd spent my entire life looking for that solution. I spent my entire life not figuring out why I could be walking around with six Grammys, yet I was a guy that couldn't stop from trying to hurt everybody around me. I, I was a guy who couldn't comprehend and even understand that anything my father or my grandfather did was mild compared to how sick I was and the behaviors I'd done. Because like a true alcoholic, I was incapable of taking that mirror and there's so many mirrors in this big book and putting it back and looking at myself and seeing the true sick person I was. I, uh, I, I would say, hopefully at this point, my, my program has changed a lot. Um, and I, 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 I test a lot of that to, to strong sponsorship, to a strong lineage, but I also test a lot of that too. You know, I hear, I'll hear guys share, I'll, I hear guys for 20 years, but like, oh, I don't sponsor. I, I don't do that. Um, I make coffee. I'm not a good sponsor learn this program by sponsoring others and, and my sponsor henry i should he's going to kill me when he hears me say this on this platform but i'm going to say it like he told me in the beginning he's like look paul he's like you're gonna have to kill a couple alcoholics before you get it he's like keep doing it and i'm like that's horrible I'm like i don't want to kill anybody but i wasn't a good sponsor in the beginning i was i became a what i would like to say at least as a decent sponsor now because i was willing to take actions that i, I wouldn't normally take and that's what this program is about. It's about taking actions I would normally take. I go to, a, if I'm here tonight speaking on a Saturday night. I would much rather be on the date that I had tonight than doing this. I forgot, Phil. And yeah, by the way, I'd, I'd accidentally uh, butt called you because I was checking messages from a guy that like, that's, that's the God's honest truth. Um, and then I put my number in there because I always put my number in when I speak. So that if somebody wants to reach out, they can. But yeah, I mean, like if I had a choice between Saturday night and being here with you guys or being on a date with some cute guy, sorry, deuces. But I was taught to do this. 
And Phil, Phil was smart. He caught me during a good time. I was working as a stage manager for Gay Pride in Miami Beach. I was exhausted. I'd been working like 16 hours. He's like, can you speak? I'm like, sure, whatever you need. I'm delirious. Let me do it for you. Um, and thank God you asked me to be here. Because the truth is, is that it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be of service. I, uh, if, if things work correctly, like if, if, if the universe breaks down correctly, in two more months, I will be off probation. They're making me serve five years of the 15 years. Um, and that is, that's a miracle. I shouldn't have that. I don't even know if I deserve that. Like, you know what I'm saying? And maybe that's still my disease talking. How do you take the person that you're married to for 21 years that you're supposed to love with all of your heart, pick up a cord and wrap it around that person's neck and try to, try to take their life? That's not my nature. I'm not that kind of person. But my disease took me to a place where I was capable of taking actions that I couldn't even fathom watching on a show without being appalled, yet will try to justify it in my head. That's how sick this alcoholic is. And I share those kind of things with you guys so that you can see how this disease works because it's progressive. I had a guy last night. Um, I'm going to close with this. I had a guy last night that I sponsored for a long time who thought he could, I got this. I love that. I got this. Okay, cool. Well, don't take my suggestions. Don't go to a meeting. Don't do your steps. Like, don't, you got this. He called me last night in hysterics. Um, and I love this guy. Like, I love the hell out of this guy. He's, he's, one, of, he's one of my favorite sponsees. He, uh, he called me because he had locked his kid in the car at a valet and couldn't find the car because he was drunk. He had to call the police. The police had to come find the kid. Kid was fine. And he finally, he was like, I met my body. He's like, it can't get any worse than this. He's like, this is the, he's like, that's it. He's like, I surrender. I'm an alcoholic. And I said, that's great. I said, I'm really proud of you, Joseph. I'm like, I'm glad that you finally get it. I said, but do you realize I said, this is probably God doing for you what you can't do for yourself? I said, CPS is going to get involved. I said, you're going to possibly lose your kid for a while. I said, your life, I said, and let me tell you, I said, you think you haven't crossed that yet line? I said, I didn't think I'd cross that yet line when I stuck a cord around my ex-husband's neck. I said, yes, you can keep going. I said, you haven't killed your wife or your child yet or yourself. I said, those are still possibilities. I said, if you think it can't get worse, I said, it can't. I said, bro, let me tell you, I said, jails, institutions, and death. And he was like, no, I got this. I'm going to call this, this friend of ours. He's like, I'm going to ask him to sponsor me because I don't think I want you to sponsor me. He's like, we tried it multiple times because he still thinks the sponsors are Bro, your sponsor can't keep you sober. Only your actions you take in this program can keep you sober. But I was like, cool, I will support you in this process. And this morning, Joseph, come to my house. We'll sit down. We'll talk. I can't. He's already taken his well back because this disease is so cunning and so baffling. And he is just as sick as I was that he is unwilling after locking his kid in the car. And I'm not saying this in a judgment way. I'm saying, man, like what's this guy's bottom? He's unwilling to see that he's already starting to take his well back. He's one of these guys that I walked through the steps and intellectually grasped it, but didn't spiritually grasp it. So he's incapable of understanding that he suffers from a disease that will literally within hours start to pull him back in and destroy him one thought at a time. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I absolutely, I, I love this program. It saved me. It saved me. It gave me a life that I can't imagine. And when I tell you my life was shot out five years ago, I, I, it was horrible. I was a man living in a sober living house. My mom paid my rent. I was living on food stamps. I live in Miami Beach today on the ocean, and I probably have more money than I'll ever know what to do with. And I can't, and I'm telling you, I can't honestly tell you how that happened, except that, that all I did was take the actions outlined in this program, and God gave me a life beyond my wildest dreams. My ex-husband, who I talked to two hours ago, is my best friend, my very best friend in the entire world. We talk daily. We have a relationship stronger than we ever had when we were married. And that's because of this program, because it was able to repair the damage I did. My mom knows she can, if she calls me and asks me for something, I show up, she can trust me. She knows she's not going to get a call at four in the morning with me insane. Like, insane. The people in my life know that I'll be a part of their lives now. If you are in this room tonight and you're new, or you've been here a while, maybe you're in your first 30 days, maybe in your last 30 days. I don't know. There's a lot of, you know, there's multiple ways to leave this program. But if you 
think that you're an alcoholic or you want help with alcoholism, you're in the right place. I assure you, if you're an alcoholic like me who didn't think you were an alcoholic, stick around, learn the program, get a sponsor, take action, work the steps, do the things that are outlined by the people around you, and you have an opportunity. And I, and I, I, I thought it was BS when I first read in the big book, but you have an opportunity to live a life that is beyond your wildest dreams where you will truly be rocked of the fourth dimension and have a freedom that you cannot comprehend or compare. Thank you guys for letting me share tonight.